It was the kind of invention that rewrites history, the kind that shifts the world on its axis and leaves no time for second thoughts. It was the kind of rare invention where we can write history in terms of what happened before and what happened after this single great game changer arrived on the scene. We're talking, of course, about the Ford Model T. You can see that in the title of today's episode. An automobile that first rolled off the production line in 1908 and sold over 15 million copies in the next 20 years. An affordable, widely available automobile, one that prompted the evolution of an entire industry of auto manufacturing, the Model T is revered today as the machine to which every modern car can pay homage. But the Model T also had a hell of a dark side. It had a well-earned reputation as a death trap, and it played a massive role in building a manufacturing industry that often dehumanized and exploited its workers. While it was largely responsible for the creation of a massive American middle class, it was just as responsible for the rise in wealth inequality that left millions of others in the dust. In today's video, we're going to be looking at both ends of the Model T's legacy as a revolutionary, busted, innovative, troubled car, and one that left all of America in its wake. For better, or perhaps for worse. In today's world, the name Henry Ford conjures up a very clear image. A super wealthy business magnate decked out in a top tier suit and a dope ass hat, and resting proudly on the frame of one of the millions upon millions of Model T cars that his Ford Motor Company was responsible for. But ask that same question to anyone on the streets of Detroit in 1893, and you'd probably get one of two responses. The first, of course, would be a lot of blank confusion. Not many people in those days knew who or what a Henry Ford. Ford was at all. But for those who did recognize the name, they'd tell you not of a billionaire entrepreneur, but of a humble engineer from just outside the city. Ford, then chief of engineering at Edison Illuminating Company, was evolving into the very picture of an American success story from the turn of the century. He had a good job, a lovely wife, and had just welcomed his first son into the world. But Ford also had another baby on his mind, a brainchild that could change all of their lives and change the world too. It was a gasoline engine, one he was first able to get fired up for a span of 30 seconds on Christmas Eve 1893, but within a couple of years he had worked the concept into shape. Ford wasn't exactly doing anything new by making an internal combustion engine. Those had existed as early as 1860, first built by Belgian engineer Etienne Lenoir and made practical a year later by Nicolas Auto of Germany. Automobiles existed too as early as the 1880s, but Ford hoped to take the auto business from something of a fascination, one that provided horseless carriages as something of an oddity for the rich and famous to play with, into a real industry. One that made good, functional, accessible machines for the mass market. Ford's first automobile, the four-horsepower quadricycle, was a valuable proof of concept, and his successor designs, the Model A in 1903 and the Model B and C in 1904, and a number of follow-on cars over the next few years, all came together to work Ford closer and closer to a winning design. By this time, Ford had left his prior job and founded the Ford Motor Company, which set up shop in the same state of Michigan where Ford had spent his whole life. But after 19 individual designs, labeled A through S, were drawn out, examined, and either left on the table or put into production, the Ford Motor Company finally found their golden goose. Designed by three of Ford's engineers, an American named Charles Harris Wills and two Hungarians, Joseph Galam and Eugene Farkas, the Model T came together in early 1907. It was built with two main goals in mind, to be affordable for the average American and to be sturdy enough to deal with dirt roads, ice, snow, and all other tough driving conditions across the country. Ford Motor Company's prior automobiles were certainly good for their time, but they still didn't address those key concerns in the way that Ford wanted, and it was up to the Model T to finally change that. The automobile was designed with simplicity in mind, eliminating sources of failure rather than trying to add too many bells and whistles. Its engine, a simple four-cylinder capable of 20 horsepower, was built in a way that it could process not just gasoline, but kerosene, which was already commonly available as tractor and generator fuel, as well as ethanol, which people could brew at home. The engine and all parts of the car were designed with ease of repair in mind. A local auto repairman with access to a few spare parts should be able to maintain his town's model all by himself without factory support. 
The car's frame was designed to keep the engine clear from water and protect the most valuable parts of the vehicle rather than leave them exposed. These might be rather obvious steps to take in today's world, but in Ford's time, each one was a major improvement on the status quo. And if Henry Ford was going to sell an automobile to the masses, it was also going to have to teach them to drive the bloody thing. To make his Model T as user-friendly as possible, his engineers developed an epicyclic gearbox, a device that allowed a driver to change gears on the vehicle without difficulty. They installed an accelerator as a lever on the steering wheel and a floor pedal system that didn't include a gas pedal but a brake, a gear shifter, and a clutch. They could be used in agricultural settings as a stationary power source for generators, threshers, or water pumps, and they were easily modified in case a vehicle owner's needs didn't fit the base version of the car. Ford Motor Company hoped that these innovations would be enough to truly supply a car for the masses. Said Ford of his own dream, I will build a motor car for the great multitude. It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials, by the best men to be hired after the simplest designs that modern engineering can devise. But it will be so low in price that no man making a good salary will be unable to own one and enjoy with his family the blessing of hours of pleasure in God's great open spaces. But. Just as important as Ford's intention to create supply was whether or not the public could actually generate demand, or if they were a bit slow on the uptake, whether the Ford Motor Company and their business allies could convince the world that the Model T was what they needed. The Model T first hit the production line in the fall of 1908, built by hand at such a slow pace that only 11 were made in the first month. In these early days, the Ford Motor Company hadn't yet broken out of the typical patterns of auto manufacturers at the time, but by New Year's Day 1910, they would take a massive step in the right direction. On that day, they would move Model T production from their first plant at Piquette Avenue in Detroit to a new plant at Highland Park. A few years afterward, Ford perfected an innovation that was perhaps even more meaningful in the long arc of history than his Model T ever would be the modern assembly line. The Model T was a major step toward the idea of standardization. That is, a manufacturing process where the goal isn't necessarily to produce a unique, striking masterpiece with each product, but instead to ensure that the same product of the same quality is produced every single time. In practice, this meant taking a whole legion of workers and assigning each of them a single task rather than attempting to treat each one as a craftsman who could manage the construction of an entire vehicle. If they were assigned to, say, start spinning a couple of nuts onto a specific couple of bolts, then the point wasn't to attach as many nuts as they could or to do it with any particular level of finesse. As long as every car ended up with the same correct number of nuts on the same bolts, they were doing their job just fine. This meant that what the Ford company was looking for were massive numbers of what economists would consider unskilled or low-skilled workers, people whose jobs are to perform a specific task rather than build a given thing. It was a point of pride for Henry Ford and his executives that those workers were well paid, making double what other industrialists would pay at about $5 a day, and bringing home enough money to their families that they too could save up for a Ford automobile one day. But more important to Ford in practice was the fact that his Model Ts could start off as a collection of parts lying around the factory and be put together quickly in predetermined order in a matter of hours. With all of his workers arranged around conveyor belts working quickly and efficiently as a unit, Ford was able to speed production so much that in 1914 a Model T could be fully assembled in 93 minutes. And the model had some ancillary benefits for Mr. Ford's own pockets as well. From a business perspective, even the best paid unskilled worker didn't command half the price that a true craftsman would have done. With the help of mass production, Ford's motor company had no trouble finding the public demand that they'd hoped for. In 1912, the Model T would have cost something around $600 compared to the average earnings of an American household of $592. Put in simple terms, that's prohibitively expensive for the average person. But in 1924, when the average American's earnings had ballooned to $1,300 a year, a Model T cost now less than $300, and as many as 10,000 of them were coming off the Detroit assembly line every single day. Sales took off, then doubled, then doubled again until the Model T became synonymous with automobile technology as a whole. Between 1917 and 1923, Ford wouldn't run a single ad. The Model T was already so normalized, so ubiquitous, that there was no need for advertising. In terms of what they offered to drivers and families, the Model T 
revolutionized daily life. Communities became far more integrated. Regions of individual states began to cohere into their own economies. Shipping became far more feasible in rural areas, and they became a testbed for new advances in materials engineering. The cars were also praised for their modularity, the ease by which they could be modified, converted for other purposes, or even deconstructed and reconfigured into things like ice saws that bore little resemblance to the car from whence they'd come. The Model T set off a cascade of new aftermarket companies, each manufacturing their own packages and modifications to the car in order to turn it into anything from a tractor to a hay baler to an electrical generator. Their engines were converted and incorporated to homemade aircraft. They became popular in the northern reaches of Canada, where they were outfitted with skis and dubbed snow flyers. The car's resounding popularity would eventually lead to some 15 million units sold, at one time making up over 50% of the cars in the United States. Even when the Model T was eventually brought down, it was replaced by cars from other manufacturers that had been forced to directly improve on Ford's model rather than going off in their own directions. When Ford began to issue new models of car, they would start again at Model A, stating that everything they'd done before the Model T represented an era that no longer existed. Around the world, Model Ts would be built in Canada, England, Japan, Germany, Argentina, Spain, France, Brazil, and elsewhere, sowing the seeds for automakers in other countries to gain the expertise and machinery that they'd use to start their companies later. In 1999, the Global Automotive Elections Foundation declared the Model T to be the car of the century, and it's regarded today, rightly so, as the single most important automobile of all time. So, in its early years, the Model T didn't even have wheel brakes. The only thing it had was a brake on the transmission, meaning that even in a car that could go up to 45 miles an hour, getting it to stop was a perilous or even terrifying affair. Ford only fixed the issue after third-party manufacturers started mass-producing their own wheel brakes, which customers could add on to their cars after purchase. And the Model T's problems only got worse, way worse in fact, in the event of a crash. Its windshield, made of flat glass, could deliver some truly gnarly cuts if a person were to be hit or thrown through it, and it even had a knack for impaling the unfortunate souls who only partially fell through it. The gas tanks located under the front row of seats were a fantastic fire hazard in the event of an accident, leading to horrific burns. The car's crank starter had a rather inconvenient habit of swinging backwards and breaking people's arms in the event of an engine backfire, and it wasn't unheard of for the handle to explode off from the car like a javelin. And the Model T suffered from serious vibration issues, especially in the likely event that small pebbles or debris got lodged into the engine, or in the event that low-quality fuel was used. Whether these long-standing safety issues were the result of the Ford Motor Company's cost-cutting practices, or the two simply happening to coincide, is not for us to say. But it should be noted that Ford's production lines were a penny pincher's perfect fantasy. For example, the car was first offered in a number of different colors, but by 1913, Henry Ford's famous quote, you could have any color you want as long as it's black, had become the rule of law due to black paint being relatively cheap. Ford also believed that it dried faster than other paint colors, allowing it to be sped through the assembly line quicker. Beyond simple aesthetics, though, any number of the Model T's issues could have been solved in successive model years, but Henry Ford and his executives weren't interested in that sort of rapid advancement. The Model T evolved only a few times in its 19 years of production, and many of its most critical safety issues just went unaddressed. And while we're on the subject of the assembly line, it's important that we take a moment and open up that entire can of worms. We obviously want to give credit where it's due, for the Ford Motor Company's commitment to fair pay for their laborers, but that commitment only tells half the story. For those $5 daily, workers lived through a repetitive and painfully monotonous job, often in situations where the very natural lapses of attention in eight hours of doing the same simple task could lead to workplace accidents and injury. In the words of one auto worker in the 1920s, the machine I am on goes at such a terrific speed that I can't help stepping on it in order to keep up with it. The machine is my boss. These workers also found themselves inside a factory system in which floor workers performing rather basic tasks became expendable. Stay home sick, or make a few minor errors on the floor one day, or, you know, lose a finger in an accident, and those workers faced a real risk that the next day they showed up, they'd find that someone else was doing their job. This functionally eliminated the leverage that workers had to advocate for themselves and their rights, a gaping hole that modern unions and regulators still struggle to address. And then there's the illusion that the Ford Company's $5 a day structure produced some great manufacturing renaissance for Americans, an illusion that falls apart quickly under scrutiny. 
Within the first few years of production, the Ford Company had replaced many of their American-born laborers for Eastern and Southern European unskilled workers who were willing to work for lower pay. By 1914, three-quarters of Ford's employees were foreign-born, and many didn't speak English. While there's certainly a strong argument that the Ford Company was a lifeline to people trying to make a new life in America, it was not the paragon of American manufacturing that it is often held up to be. Under such a rigorous system, dealing with workers whose job was to work fast with no questions asked, the Ford Motor Company was on the forefront of developing social control measures to keep their laborers moving at the highest possible pace. A few seconds cut out of one worker's allotted time to fulfill their task could mean a dozen, or two dozen, or even a hundred extra automobiles produced per week without having to hire any new personnel. As such, workers were closely scrutinized all day, every day, with a small army of foremen and inspectors encouraging their workers to move faster and faster. Failure to keep pace with the rest of the line was grounds for dismissal, and so too was failure to keep up with the peak operating capability of a tool or piece of equipment. If a drill could screw in 10 screws a minute, but a worker only moved fast enough to screw in 7, then that was the worker's problem. As we can probably expect, worker burnout went through the roof, a process that's been repeated in hundreds of thousands of assembly line plants worldwide, all following the model that Ford Motor Company laid out for them. And we've also got to poke into their promise of a $5 day just a little bit more, divided as it was into two sections when the system first debuted in 1914. A floor worker at Ford's plant was actually only making $2.40 in wages. The remaining two sixty were profits, which they could only receive if they satisfied Ford's requirements. This included, of course, consistently working a bloody fast pace on the factory floor, but also exhibiting so-called American values in and out of the workplace, living in the sorts of homes that Ford and his executives deemed appropriate and following at-work habits and procedures that Ford Company set out for them. The financial incentive of receiving these profits, at little more than half of what a worker hoped to make in a day, was enough to provide Ford with incredible leverage over its employees. Talking on the factory floor was prohibited, bathroom breaks were tightly restricted, workers went without pay for the time it took to set up their equipment, and Ford was able to intimidate and coerce his workers to avoid unionization until as late as the 1930s. Amidst all the questionable practices on the Ford factory floor, we've also got to consider how these factories' existence impacted the rest of the world. In fact, it's not unreasonable to claim that the Model T directly led to the obsolescence of classical craftsmen, whose higher quality artisan work simply couldn't compete with big name branded items that did just fine at the same task. Assembly lines and the companies that operated them quickly came to dominate the manufacturing sector both in America and around the world, wiping out small shop innovators who had previously occupied the same niche while rendering their expertise relevant in a world where every assembly line worker made the same wage regardless of how many years of study they'd already devoted to their craft. And then there's the Model T's effects on wealth distribution, where for a car that's often touted for having built the American middle class, it actually did very little to increase the wealth of people who owned it. From 1917 to 1979, the Model T's heyday, the bottom 90% of Americans actually endured a steady loss of wealth overall compared to considerable gains made in the following decades. In those same few years, income inequality continued to rise to a peak in 1926, in which the top 1% of Americans collected more than 20% of nationwide income. And while people who could get a Model T did enjoy the mobility and other perks that helped them become true middle-class Americans, those who couldn't get one had no way to make up for the deficit in a world that increasingly treated cars as a base requirement for success. Lastly, we've got to pull out the curtain on an especially nasty part of the Model T's history, Henry Ford's decision to use his best-selling car as a tool to propagate anti-Semitism. By the late 1910s, Ford himself had become a virulent anti-Semite, blaming Jews for every form of evil that he could perceive in the world, and in 1918, he purchased the Dearborn Independent, a local newspaper from his hometown. Within 18 months, he was publishing radically hateful articles claiming that America was being infected by a Jewish conspiracy. And those articles? Well, Ford dealers were required to sell their customers a subscription to the Dearborn Independent with every Model T they sold. It's impossible to overstate how massive an effect Ford's practices had on spreading anti-Semitism across the U.S. But suffice to say that Adolf Hitler took a personal interest in praising Ford's work and even awarded Ford's the Grand Cross of the German Eagle just a year before Nazi Germany's invasion of Poland. So, with all of that in mind, we can clearly see the Ford Model T and its complex legacy. It was a revolutionary invention, a car that shaped the entire automotive industry, and moreover, the entire world. It was the harbinger of an entire century of mass manufacturing, a tool to bring about a more accessible and interconnected world, and one that raised the standard of American life to a massive degree. But at the same time, it was 
an absolutely busted automobile, ones whose passengers often paid the price for Henry Ford's decision to cut costs. It was a driver of wealth inequality, of appalling anti-Semitism, and it left behind a legacy of worker exploitation that's largely been whitewashed in the modern day. It's complex history for a complex machine that was, for better or worse, among the most influential of all time.